So in your project designs, if you're working on something like this this semester, you want to start thinking about not only, and we'll talk about this later, the load, you know, what the load bearing capacity is of the roof, but also how you can create some positive drainage. So going back to this design, you might actually monkey around with what happens in between that waterproof membrane and the roof because you can actually sculpt the rigid styrofoam panels to bring the water right down there and seal the whole system. So you create a fake, fake topography that allows that to drain off the roof at the rate that you want. As a designer, you can choose from many different sizes of these drainage boards. So you can, it's a really good tool to manage your water retention on the roof. If you can handle the weight, these are easily taken up to hold a one inch drain capacity. And there, I've seen deep cup designs that are like this thing. You know, really, that um, will hold a two inch rain. But a one inch rain or right around there, those are very, those are very commonly done and they're sort of standard practice. Even with the green roofs, these are recognized as stormwater management practices. So this sort of takes care of your water issue. It gives you some benefits there. It does protect the roof. Um, Carrie mentioned the UV protection, UV radiation protection, um, and also just protecting the roof from punctures for roof maintenance. Um, and then there are obviously some aesthetic benefits. One of the most important things to realize is how challenging this growth environment is and how limiting water is and add to that the rain, or excuse me, exposure to wind and also higher levels of radiation than what you get at the ground level, the higher you go up, yes. What was the WP barrier, is that water? Waterproof. Waterproof barrier. Yeah, waterproof barrier, some kind of membrane. On really expensive buildings, there's actually one more thing, which is a sensor that goes on the roof, and it's a, grid sensor, and if there's a leak anywhere, it sends off a little alarm and it shows you right where it is. Do we have any of those on campus? No, but if you talk to, and we will talk to Jeffrey L. Bruce, like the Kaufman Center for Performing Arts, all those major uh, public projects will install that because you might have a leak somewhere in your structure, and this water is moving all over this roof, so you don't actually know if you, you can have a leak in the building over here, but the source of the water could be anywhere in this little watershed. So that, that um, sensing system actually locates the, the leak right away, and it, it gives you information about the origin of, of that water. And so what they do is they can then go in and go right to the source of the, the original source of that water patch the membrane or do what they need to do. Otherwise, they have to tear up the entire roof. And the thicker the roof gets, the more challenging that prospect becomes. So in terms of plant palate, <clears throat> sedums and other succulents work very well on these very um, thin green roofs because and translate what the soil specs in here say and begin to translate to what you already know about the performance of soils and the texture triangle. <coughs> so I'm just going to point out the texture triangle that you see at the top is a USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture texture triangle and their particle size classes at the bottom, there's a scale, and the USDA particle size classes are in that bar, and those relate to the texture triangle. 
But there are also two other systems of specifications, and of course they have their own classifications. One of the ones you'll see a lot are ASHO, or AAS, actually AASHO, um, and this is one system of specifications, and then the other is a unified system of specifications. That's, these are based on contracting and civil engineering paradigms, whereas USDA is based on agricultural, agronomic paradigms. So we're going to translate um, across these models. So um, again, reading the texture triangle, um, you're going to follow the line out perpendicular to the side that relates to the particle size class. So, oh, um, you know, at 20, clay, we go perpendicular, and that's actually the boundary between loamy sand and sand dune. Does everybody see that? I want to make sure that you know how to do this. And then the sand, the uh, line that's um, on the um, sand side, if you line up the number with the line across the triangle, just read that straight across. That tells you where the sand particle size classes are. So you read in line with the number right across the triangle. So let's see what they're putting in these soils. Let's go to, um, this, this is a set of soils, a group, uh, these are actually not soils, these are growing media from one company, and we'll just go to page 14 and see what Roof Life Extensive MCL has in it. So in the specification at the top, they talk about particle size distribution. And the Top line says proportion of silting components less than 0.063 millimeters in terms of the total mass of the mineral soil has to be less than or equal to 10 percent. You see that? So let's look at this. Where is 0.063 on this chart. Let's just find it down here on the scale. Let's see where it goes up to the top. I'm marking mine. I did the, I made a copy so that you could mark yours if you want. See where point zero six three is? Less than 10% of the fines in it. 
which automatically makes it a sand or a gravel texture. So this extensive MCL, this is sand, or it could be a gravelly sand, but it's, uh, or sandy gravel could be it. Because we have gravel over here, the texture triangle really talks about the finer classes. So, what does that suggest to you about water retention, porosity, cation exchange capacity, just of the mineral stuff? It's going to be lots of drainage, right? Because it's really super drained. drained. Yeah, super well drained. And how about water holding? Go to the, now go to the front page of your handout, your lab. Coarse sand and gravel, available water, inches per inch, 0 0.02 to 0.06 inches per inch. Field capacity, which is the water that would be retained on the roof. You say it would never leave the roof. 0.2 to 0.7 inches per foot. Of um, that should be inches per foot on that available water, not inches per inch, inches per foot. So 0.2 to 0.7 inches per foot, and here we on that three inch roof we have a third of that. Okay. So the water retention on a really thin green roof is actually pretty minimal for the growing medium itself, except there's a secret weapon. Actually, there are two. This is the secret weapon of three years. Yes, yes. So what that is, is an expanded shale, clay, or slate. So for the aggregate, what they actually do is they take rock and they run it through a kiln and they heat it up and it actually expands and opens up like lava rock. And so now we have aggregates that are actually porous. So those big chunks that are in there have pores in them that are capable of holding water. And then we have sand in there too. Expanded shale, clay, or slate holds 10% of its weight in water, or you can estimate 15 pounds of water per cubic foot. And that's based on three quarter inch aggregate, but it actually doesn't change very much as you change size, so. You can convert those pounds of water into soil volumes, and I have a conversion factor for you here. But the point is that suddenly our rock, which is really heavy and doesn't hold water, now is light and holds water. So we are actually gonna boost our water holding capacity in these soils a little bit. By, or by making these soils and these, meat, and these growth media a little bit by using this product. And it's widely available, easily, easy to get, locally sourced. Usually you can get it in a 250 mile radius. Um, there are other things that people <coughs> use in green groups, but if weight is a concern, this is a product that's usually specified by, by um, professionals. So that's our first secret weapon. Our second secret weapon is compost, which is also regionally available. If it's not locally available, it should be regionally available. And uh, regular compo compost can hold 25% of its volume in water. Bark compost can hold 37% of its volume in water it has more lignin, so it's 
got all these little spirally forms and it has a lot of places for water to attach. Um, I was reviewing some <clears throat> papers this morning to sort of ferret out these numbers and really try to nail them down. It's amazing how slippery they get when you start thinking, really? Is that total water? Is that available water? What kind of water are we talking about? Um, and I um, found a reliable source, a credible source, that basically said for every 1% of organic matter content increase, the soil can hold 16,500 gallons of plant available water per acre in soil 12 inches. So this was a study where they were looking at adding compost on sandy soils to make them more drought resistant and to render them useful for uh, vegetable production. That translates to 1.5 quarts of plant available water per cubic foot of soil. For each percentage, but, um, a three inch layer of leaf compost incorporated in a six inch depth increased water holding capacity 2.5 times that of the unamended portion. And that was enough to provide a seven day water supply of plant available water for I think this might be the secret of those rooftop farms, right? You start thinking about how are they getting enough water and enough nutrients to be able to do that in this extremely limiting environment. How's that happening? So based on those metrics, for each percent of organic matter we add, there are 1.5 quarts more available water per cubic foot of soil and we can convert that to a cubic foot of plant available water per cubic foot of soil. We want for 3.34 available water increase. We're not gonna use that one today, but we're gonna use it. So, <coughs> wow, compost is really gonna increase our water holding capacity and our ESCS adds to this as well. So a typical living green roof soil, which this specification is, is going to be about 80% of the ESCS and about 20% of some kind of other stuff. Um, reasonable to think 15% would be some kind of sand or loamy sand, something like that, and up to 5% would be compost. That's a pretty reasonable recipe, just as a general thing. I'm sharing these specs with you not because I want you to go out and buy this product or think this is the only thing. It's just that this is accessible, so we can really pull this apart and look at these. But just like Jim Patchett and the guys at CDF did when they did these roofs, you can make your own recipe. They just have to have these parts, and you have to have enough porosity that the water goes out, but you have to use these secret weapons to hold enough water back that you can actually grow plants. If you want to grow lush vegetation, you have to um, provide for that. So the rest of these particles, and the way this recipe works, by the way, is they identify a sieve size. So there's an opening, and X percent of the material has to be able to pass that sieve size. So as you move up, you see at the last level, 80 to 100 percent of the material passes through the last sieve. So it's kind of a weird way to think about a recipe, but that's how they do it to establish those particle size classes. The other thing now going down in this recipe is look at the organic matter content. This is expressed in terms of grams per liter, but down here. So eight grams of organic compost, organic matter compost per liter of that other mineral fraction. So that's kind of a kind of a weird way of uh, uh, representing that. Um, 
But um, compost is at uh, 40 to 60 percent moisture capacity already. So if we're really going to drill down on that, we would end up um, having to add that back in. The other um, thing that we want to look at is under density measurements. Bulk density at max water holding capacity in pounds per cubic foot, 66 to 72. And then look at bulk density on a dry weight basis, 35 to 50. So right there, you have, that's where you get your water metric. We could actually find the difference. If we wanted to calculate the water holding capacity of this mixture for our own purposes, they're not going to give that to us, but we would get it by subtracting the dry weight bulk density from the saturated weight, and then we get the amount of water that it's actually holding for us. We're not going to do that, but I want you to know you, you can do that. It's an alpha product. What is going to the last sheet, it's on page 18, the roof light intensive ad. And on this, look at that first number on the top on the particle size distribution, and notice that now we have 20% proportion of silicon components. Okay, so just in that move alone, we, we moved up, we changed in the soil texture triangle. So let's go back to the triangle and just let's choose 20% of clay. And um, with 20% of clay in the texture triangle, we're going perpendicular to the number. Now look at that. Or let's just try 20% of silk, see where that takes us. Well, those numbers are getting us into the loamy sand range or the sandy loam range, just on the basis of the mineral fraction. So they're, they're moving us up in terms of our water holding capacity and also, along the way, that's also cation exchange capacity or the ability to hold nutrients. So if we go up here and look at these loamy sands, we can see that between the coarse sand and gravel number, 0.2 to 0.7, now we're 0.7 to 1.4, so we just doubled our water holding capacity. Just with that one move. The organic matter, if we go back into our specifications, now we're at 70 to 90 grams per liter of mix. So the low, the low range of the extensive mix, the shallow roof was 25. The low range on the ag mix is now at 70 to 90. And, um, as you think about the impacts of the increase in organic matter as well, that is also cation exchange capacity and it is also water holding capacity. There are other, there are some other shifts in the top. One of the things is there's nothing over three eighths of an inch in the gravel size fraction, which means that that also is going to have higher water holding capacity. Whereas those bigger, chunkier pieces, the interior parts of those expanded aggregates are less, that's less available water than in the smaller chunks. Um, the final thing, um, when you look at this, look down where it says nutrients, milligrams per liter. On the intensive ag, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, and then let's just compare that really quickly to the extensive mix. Between the two, the mix that's for the thin grain roof is 200 milligrams per liter 
The mix that is for the agriculture use is 500 milligrams per liter. The potassium goes from 700 in the thin mix to 1,000 in the ag mix. The magnesium goes to 200 and it stays the same. And the nitrate plus ammonium is 80 to 100. So the biggest leap is actually in phosphorus. Kind of interesting, especially in the wake of our discussion about what the what is the most limiting nutrient, you know, the phosphorus, and how also with the microbial action that I imagine you begin to have with this level of organic content, you would begin to reap the benefits of that activity. Um, so there are tweaks that you can do when you're making mixes, and, and I would treat these as a kind of um, very refined recipe. And when you buy this mix, basically you're buying their spec, and then you have to source the components, and that's why there's always a range, because it depends where you get the product. So the ESCS may vary, and it's available water holding capacity and where it puts the pH. Um, the compost is going to vary depending on the stock that's used to create it. Um, and so all these factors are going to be balanced by the people at this company. They basically work for you and you, you make the spec and you have the mix made, but it's going to be regionally sourced. There's not one big plant where they make the same product and they ship it out the door. So that's how these things work. Um, in terms of the layers, if you flip over to page 12, there's a very useful diagram. Um, and what it shows you is on the top one, uh, with the thin groups, which are called extensive groups, but again, you know, the, those breakdowns become less meaningful as you get. Basically, anything over anything over 12 inches is landscape on structure, and you just get into a whole other set of design parameters. So, I don't even like to use those words really. I'd rather define the performance. Um, these are these are play to industry and sales and things like that. And I think as designers, we're really designing for performance. And you might need a five inch roof to do what you want or a 12 and a half inch roof. And you know, at a certain point, those are not that meaningful. But what these diagrams show is what the layers are that you need and how thick they need to be in order for your roof to perform if you use these specs. But these aren't that dramatically different from what everybody does. They just break it down so that anyone can do this. You can assemble the parts. So the thin roofs, we have the drain board. The deeper roofs, they're not showing. Um, they have roof light drain, which is a medium that they sell. Um, um, underneath there, then they have a separator fabric, and then they actually have their intensive soil. And you can see at different levels how, what the proportion is between the growing medium and the underground levels. What's really interesting is when you come over here to around 20 inches deep that we start to see a new layer of new soil that's come in and that is the same as the roof light intensive so the really rich organic and silt based one is actually being placed over a leaner uh, mix it has the same exact textural dimension but doesn't have the organics and doesn't have the fines and what they're doing is they're mimicking a natural soil profile so that in the top you have a more organic more uh, uh, nutrient rich more water rich layer and at the lower level you have more of the aggregates and as things leach out of the top, they're going to be actually starting to be captured and coat those lower, lower particles. Okay, so now it's starting to work like an actual soil, which is kind of interesting. The separation fabric, I was reading the specifications for that. 
They say that it prevents, um, it does, it's not clogging. When you read the opening sizes, all the fine particles could actually go through there. So I'm like, hmm, what's going on here? And I think what's going on there is they've designed this so that that actually attracts the roots. And you get another root mat that's sort of a fine roots that spread out through the separator fabric. And they're actually going to benefit from the fines that are captured in that felty layer. So that's kind of interesting. Um, the separator fabric is not a root barrier. It's just keeping all the stuff up above from going down and um, penetrating into the, the drain layer. Underneath the drain layer, you would have your root barrier and your other layers that we talked about that are really more about protecting the roof. But this is all, this is a very cal carefully calibrated system for providing nutrients and water on these elevated structures that have to be light and they have to be able to um, sustain the, the plant life that's planned. So, the descriptions in here are pretty good too. I would consider this decent reading. Just realize that it's written persuasively to sell you their product, but there are some good bits of information in here. And if you compare this to what with um, Susan Weiler's text, it will um, make sense, I think, and make it a little more accessible. You guys want to take a break and get up and walk around and stretch? Um, but in two weeks, we're going to come back to this and we're going to talk about what the implications are for loading on a structure because you, would, you will have to have a conversation with an architect or an engineer in order to finish this design. Okay. So um, if we just think about this um, problem, we have, um, we have uh, soil volume that we can define or a growing medium volume that we can define. And then we have a drainage layer that's going to help us um, with water. And in the growing medium, we have components that we know their uh, properties in terms of holding water. So we know we're going to have ESCS and that it's going to hold water at a certain rate. And then we're going to have some kind of mineral component, finer mineral component, and it's going to have its own rate. And then we're going to have an organic matter component, and it's going to have a rate. So to figure out how much water is going to be held in this growing medium, we figure out its volume. And then we figure out proportionally how much each of those um, contribute. And we're just going to add the total amount of water that each component holds to come up with the total water in the soil or in the growing medium. And then the second component that we look at <coughs> is the drain board. And you can specify lots of different sizes, but we're just going to use one inch. It's a common size. Um, and it makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, lower capacity drain boards might be useful if you're trying to save a lot of money or if you're in a climate where there isn't really intense rain, but you need to remember that in intense rains, the drain board functions to help water evacuate the roof. So it's not just holding that inch of rain, it's also the size of these void spaces and how much water you can move. So those bigger voids make your roof a little more resilient to flooding as well. So you get to hand a little water, but you also a little more water, but you also can drain it faster. So there are advantages to going with a big, with a big fat, thick drain board. 
So in terms of the calculations, I, if you look in your lab, I have to find the
It just simplifies the math. Or you can do it the long way. But if you do this, have less builders to deal with as long as you keep track of inputs. So we've got a thousand cubic feet of ESC, or excuse me, of growing medium, and now we're going to split it into these proportions. So we've got 80% ESCS, and we've got 5% um, bark compost, which gives us 15% of something else. If something else is a loamy sand. Not quite an ag soil, but the organic matter is probably a little low. So now, we know ESCS holds a rate, water at a rate of 15 pounds per cubic foot. Well, that's a weird rate. Well, we can convert that because we can figure out how many pounds of water are in a cube, uh, how many pounds of water make how many cubic feet of water. So we can basically convert that. So um, we're going to use our chart on the front. First, we have 80% ESCS, so 80% of a thousand cubic feet. We're going to have 800 cubic feet. Here, one hundred and ninety two point 